the book of Matthew this evening. The old rugged cross. Amen. You know, we ought to be thankful for the cross. Amen. We've been blessed by the cross. In fact, we're a blessed people. Oh, and that's right. Uh, so many, so many things, so many ways the Lord has blessed us. And sometimes we fail uh, to remember and fail to really give the Lord the thanks that he deserves. And I just want to say tonight, thank you, each one, for what you do. We had a preacher preaching here a long time ago. He's in heaven now. And he asked one of our men as they went out the door, uh, Brother King asked him, so what do you do here at Bible Baptist Church? He said, well, I come. He said, well, that's good, but what do you do here at Bible Baptist Church? And I thank you, each one, for what you do. I think we could all do a little more. Amen. Well, maybe we can. Uh, maybe we can. I think we could do a little more. Amen. If we would. And uh, But I do want to thank you for uh, what you do. Uh, I realize as a preacher, I'm blessed uh, with you, our people, and uh, for what you do uh, inside and out. Uh, uh, so many things. Uh, the ones that are at the doors, safety, watching over everything, watching Amen. over us. Uh, or the ones in the nursery. Uh, I thank God for them. Someone said, Preacher, why don't you preach longer? I said, The nursery workers will be after me if I do. Uh, you know, it's not easy back there in the nursery. I know, I know your, your child, Angel, no doubt about that. But I tell you, some of the rest of them aren't. And uh, so it's it's hard on them. But I, I appreciate all you take a turn to nursery. That might be just trying to get more workers, too. Uh, we could use more workers in the nursery. But I, I, do, I, I do thank you for uh, the outside work, uh, the grass, and uh, the leaves, and uh, everything that way for the ones in the sound room. And, we could use another one or two back there. Uh, and for all of these things, you just need to be faithful. Uh, if you want to sing, if you will sing for the Lord, uh, we want you uh, to have a part. This is your church. Uh, so we want you to have a part in it. Uh, for the ones at the piano and uh, the other things, uh, I thank you, each one. We are a blessed people. And uh, I just want you to know, and I, I thank God uh, for that. Tonight, uh, we're in the book of Matthew, chapter 9. I've entitled the message tonight, Things We Need to Do to Do What God Wants Us to Do. Things We Need to Do to Do what God wants us to do. And Matthew chapter 9, this really listen as we read just a few verses tonight. Matthew chapter number 9 and down about verse uh, number 9. Matthew 9, 9. And as Jesus passed by, as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man. He saw a man named Matthew. He saw him sitting at the receipt of custom, and he saith unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. Now Jesus saw this man. Jesus saw this man by the name of Matthew. By the way, Jesus is passing by here tonight. Amen. And you know what? He sees you. Amen. He sees you. And he knows your name. 
He knows all about you, just as he did Matthew. And he said to him, follow me. And he, Matthew, arose and followed him. Thank God for every Matthew who will arise and follow Jesus. Amen. Verse 10, and it came to pass, as Jesus sat at me in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. Watch that again. And it came to pass as Jesus sat at me in the house. Behold, many, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. Now, Jesus knew all about these. He knew who they was. And, but look in verse 11. And when the Pharisees saw it, they saw Jesus. There Jesus is sitting, talking and eating with the publicans, sitting there with the sinners. And the Pharisees, if you will, the religious group, they saw it and they said unto his disciples, why eateth your master with those publicans and sinners? Why does your master sit there with those type of people? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, they that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. A man by the name of Lars Hanrad, he was 38 years old. This was many years ago. He was from Mount Vernon, New York. And this man, Lars Hanrad, he was described as the unluckiest man in the world. The unluckiest man in the world. Henry was nearly electrocuted in a construction accident that put him in a coma for many, many weeks. He recovered from that accident. He hired a firm to fight for his liability claims. But one of his lawyers was disbarred. Two of the other lawyers died and his wife ran off with the other lawyer. Still, Henry's problems was no he came down with a heart problem with a liver disease that required him to be on ops continuously. And he had to take 42 pills a day to survive. And then Mr. Henry was involved in a car wreck. The police come responded to the call for help investigated the accident. But when the police left, a thief come along and held Mr. Henry up and robbed him. And when the article was written, Henry's insurance company had notified him that they was gonna cut off his workers' comp benefits and his landlord told him that he was being evicted. Very, very, Unlucky man, was he not? But you know, large handwriting was a hurting man. Hurting. Now we think we have problems, don't we? But you know what? Large handwriting was not alone in this pain. 
was not alone in the pain that he had. There's a lot of hurting people today. There are a lot of hurting people in our world. And we find that Jesus knew that. And Jesus reached out to those who were hurting. Matthew 9, 2. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer. Thy son, thy sins, be forgiven thee. And as Jesus passed forth, down in verse 9, from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting there at the receipt of the custom. It came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in the house. Behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. Get a picture. Many, many lost people came and sat down with Jesus. Four men brought a man, brought him to Jesus. But then look, while he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler, down verse 18, verse 20, and behold, a woman, which was diseased with an issue of blood, 12 years. When Jesus departed thence, Two blind men followed him. Verse 32, as they went out, behold, they brought to him a dumb man processed with a devil. We find many, many people here. And Jesus is setting them. Jesus is with these. You notice each one of these people were hurting. These, these people were hurting. Our world today is filled with hurting people. And today, the work of the church is still to reach out to hurting people in our world with the good news of Jesus Christ. We live in a we live in a changing day, if you will. Today, churches are to focus on reaching a lost world, to reach a hurting people, if you will. Matthew 9, 36, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth the laborers into his harvest. Christian, Bible Baptist Church, we must never, we must never lose sight of the fact that we exist for a purpose. And our purpose is to reach from here in Lancaster, Ohio, to the regions beyond with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our purpose, is to reach out with the gospel, reach out with the hurt. Now may I just throw this out. There's a lot of people that are hurting physically. A lot of it of their own making. A lot of it because of where and when we're living. They're hurting. We need to help when we can. But you know, the hurtingest people, I don't think that's a word, but the hurtingest people, if you will, 
are those without Jesus Christ. That's right. And we are to reach out for those. Now to do what Jesus wants us to do, if we want to do what he wants us to do, first of all, we need to follow his example. I read the story about a prostitute living in Chicago. This woman was homeless. She was wretched, failing health. This woman had been renting out her young daughter to men in order to support her drug habit. A Christian came along and witnessed it. Witnessed to this woman. Then in, that, in talking to her, he asked her and said, have you ever thought about going to church for help? And this woman, this prostitute, she looked at him and she said, church, I'll never go there. I'll never go there. I'll never go there. And she said this, they would just make me feel worse than I already do. BBC, if that woman, if that prostitute, if that woman was to walk in to our church to see If she would walk in the hill, how would you and I make her feel? How would we make her feel? Would we be friendly with her? Amen. Would we ask her to sit with us? Would we take her home with us for dinner? Would you invite her to just slide in here and sit inside of you? Would you take your Bible? your song book and open up. Help her along there. See where the preacher is preaching from. How would we make her feel? How would we make her feel? You know, I'm afraid today the church has quit following our Lord's example of reaching out to the hurt. You see, as we read the scriptures, it was the down and out who came to Jesus when he was on the earth. The down and the out. The religious wanted nothing to do with him and with Jesus. I personally believe today that the church has become so respectable that the very ones he came to seek and save are no longer welcome in our churches. <clears throat> no longer welcome. The religious crowd there, the Sadducees, I said, why is Jesus setting with them? Why is Jesus eating with them? I'll tell you why. They were the ones he came to seek and to save. He came for them. If that woman would walk in the church tonight. Would you invite her to sit right there?
Think about it. Think about it. You say, preacher, that woman wasn't real good. Yeah, but Jesus loved her. But the woman of the well, Jesus loved her. You know, Jesus loves the lost. Amen. He did, he does, and he will. Right. He loved the lost. We know that Jesus loved sinners because he called. He, uh, he, he called them. It was the Matthew. We find the, uh, a friend of the uh, uh, tax collectors and sinners, if you will. We know he loved sinners because he said, the Son of Man came to see and to save that which was lost. Amen. We know he loved sinners for God so loved the world that he came his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn to condemn, to condemn the prostitute, to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Amen. Jesus loved them. We know Jesus loved sinners because it was the apostle Paul who wrote, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. You know, God loves sinners. Amen. I'm really glad he did. Yeah. Because when he saved me, my friend, I was quite tall. I was the chiefest. <laughs> Bible Baptist Church, we all realize that loving sinners is to be the purpose of BBC. To love the lost. Our existence as a church must be aimed at bringing lost sinners to Christ and to help those who are saved to grow in the Lord. Amen. We need to follow the example of the Lord. So I go along. We need to reach out to the lost. Lost people. In the three and a half years of Jesus' public ministry, we find he was always reaching out to the lost. Reaching out to the herd. So should we today. I read a story about a man who was saying on a tack. A preacher came along and said to the man that he wouldn't hurt as much if he would read his Bible and pray more. A sociologist come along and told the man that his pain was due to the social institutions that had molded him. A psychologist come along and told the man that his pain was because his parents had potty trained him the wrong way. <laughs> the man's wife said that her husband would not hurt so much if he would get in touch with his feelings. Then there came a little boy along and said to the man, Sir, why don't you just step off the tack? Why don't you just get off the tack? You know, lost people today, they know they're lost. They know they're hurting people. And the world is a, a painful place for them. And they know that they're in pain, but they don't know what to do about it. 
My friend, you and I are going to say, we know why they're hurting. And we know the solution to their pain. Sin hurts, destroys, and kills. But Jesus Christ gives life. He is the answer. We need to just tell them about Jesus. That's the need. That's their need. That's their need. And you know, Jesus still changes people today. How many of y'all, the name Carter Fay Tucker, that name ring any bells anymore? Carla Fay Tucker made headlines in the year of 1998. She was the first woman in many, many years that was executed in the United States of America. Her crime was that she had taken a hatchet and hacked a man to death with that hatchet or axe. For that, she was put on death row in Huntsville, Texas. And there, a preacher came in and began talking with her. And in time, in time, the preacher was able to lead this woman to accept Jesus Christ as the Savior. Carla Faye Tucker received Christ as, your, as her Savior. Then she had to pay for her crime by being executed. But not before she became a changed person. The Lord saved her. Amen. The Lord saved her. You say, well, if she was saved, she shouldn't have she shouldn't have been executed. My friend, remember this. God will save a person from anything. But sin must be paid for. Her punishment was due. She accepted the Lord as her Savior. But sin, sin still being paid for. Remember David, his sin? If I'm not mistaken, he paid. The little baby died. Peace never came to David's house again. High price. Remember, sin will cost you more than you want to pay. It will keep you longer than you want to stay. Thank God he'll save us. He'll save anyone who will come to him. But my friend, but my friend, God loves sinners. Amen. And I'm glad of that. Uh, let me go on. Uh, I say the four things we want to do as the Lord wants us to do. We're going to have to have a life changing God. We preached on a lot of this this morning, but a church that wants to obey the Lord must have a life-changing gospel. Well, you see, the power of the gospel is the power to change lives like Carla Faye Tucker. Romans 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believe it to the Jew first and also to the Greek. As I said this morning, when a person comes to the Lord, he's going to be a changed person. He's going to change. He's going to change. I was looking through the Bible and just thinking, and you think real fast with me. We find a man by the name of Saul, a persecutor of the Christians. God saved him and changed him. We find Zacchaeus, that little greedy tax collector. We saw this morning the Lord changed him. We find Miriam, who was a gossip, envy, the Lord changed him. We find the woman of the well, sexual sins, 
But God changed her. Jonah, disobedient, but all oh, the gospel. We find the prodigal son wasteful and rebellious. The Philippian jailer, cruel, mean, Cornelius, an idolater, Moses, a murderer, a fugitive. We find Samson, oh, we find David, the murderer and the idolater. We find Ruth, the Moabite, the foreigner, if you will. We find Barnabas, the Levite, Philemon, that wealthy slave owner, Apollos. We find Rahab, that prostitute. We find Lydia, that Gentile. But I tell you what, they found out the power in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he saved them. Mm -hmm. I can tell you tonight, many of you here have been changed. Mm -hmm. Boy, it'd be something if we knew where everybody come from. <laughs> I'm glad we don't. But God knew. You're here tonight without Jesus, I tell you. He knows where you was, He knows where you is, and He knows where you want to be. Amen. He knows you'll be in heaven if you receive Him. You'll be in hell if you don't receive Him. But I'll tell you, the gospel has a changing power. A changing power. Look, think about Matthew. Uh, he gave his heart, his life to Jesus Christ. This man left his tax collectors. He left the office. Never more to return. You see, Matthew, when he left that, it would cause him to suffer in poverty of personal finances. It cost Matthew to leave that business. Nobody here but us, and I'll cover this so they can't hear us. You know what? Child of God, God never promised you're going to be a millionaire. He never promised you riches. He did promise you heaven if you will come to him. Amen. But all it cost a price. You know, though Matthew wasn't and didn't have the personal things that he had before, we find that his soul would prosper in the Lord. I wonder today, the song was sung this morning about, um, you know, the, when we get to heaven, our loved ones will know us, and our friends will know us, and Jesus will know us, and we will know our friends. Amen. We'll know each of those loved ones who have gone on before. Amen. But if we could talk to Matthew today, or I could name a thousand others offhand, I'm sure they would tell us, as Matthew would, the best deal he ever made in life was coming to Jesus. Amen. The best deal. The best deal. We must remember the best deals are not made on Wall Street. The best deals are made at the end of the Roman road that we talked about this morning. Made at the cross of Jesus Christ. And if you're here tonight unsaved without Jesus or listening in, I'll tell you about Jesus. My friend, the best deal that you'll ever make is when you come to Christ Jesus. Amen. I look back in my life, I've made some good deals. I made some bad deals. I paid $25 for a 49 Studebaker. Baker. <laughs> now, if you never had a Studebaker, Baker, you missed out on it all. It was good. Except it wouldn't run. <laughs> Didn't do much good. 
I had about a 1949 or 50 Hudson. I thought I got a good deal. But I tell you, I, if, if, if gas prices in those days are what they are today, we couldn't even got it out of the driveway. I mean, they, it looked like a train car, those things were so long. I thought I got a good deal. I didn't. I, 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 I did a lot of trade. I thought I got a good deal. March 1963, Lana's dad gave me $100 if I would marry her. <laughs> I thought I got a good deal. <laughs> I found out later I didn't. Well, you know what? At Calvary. At Calvary. Jesus Christ gave me the gift of eternal life. Amen. And my friend, that's the best deal ever. that I ever, ever, ever made. And you know, you'd have to say the same thing, child of God. There's no better deal. Right. If you're not saved, that's the deal of your life. That's the deal for your life. That's the deal of the eternal life. You need to come to Jesus. Amen. And child of God, these are just some things that we need to do. To do what God wants us to do. Do we really want to do what the Lord wants us to do? Ask yourself that question. Do you really want to do what the Lord wants you to do? Yeah. Or do you want the Lord to help you do what you want to do? I'm afraid that's where we are most of the time. I don't think Matthew would ever complain about everything he gave up. Yeah. I, I don't think any of those we mentioned a while ago would. I don't really think any of you. At least we shouldn't complain. But preacher, you don't know what I'm going to do. Have we all been guilty of that a time or two? <laughs> but God knows. He knows. He knows. He knows. <laughs> It's getting late. I believe the day is, the sun is setting. I believe soon we're going to find that the book is still right. It's always been right. It always told me it's right. Yeah. And one day soon we're going to see Jesus. Yeah. I believe we'll see him come. Will we, will we be able to stand before him and say, Lord, I was concerned about what you had. Will we be able to say, Lord, when that sinner came in, when that sinner walked in the Bible Baptist church, when that harlot, when that drunkard Walked in. Lord, I I let him sit by. Lord, I I gave him my seat. Lord, I I took him out to McDonald's and bought their dinner. Or would we say to him, you just walk on up to that next seat. You sit right up there. Are we willing to do what the Lord wants us to do? Amen. I'm glad he saved sinners. I'm glad he saved me. And I'm glad there's 